message, or at least part one of the message this morning. And so um, I'm going to pray for us, and then this morning we get to celebrate and talk about the advent of joy. And so before we rejoice and praise and sing, I just wanted to have our hearts and minds kind of oriented around the Word of God and what He has to say around joy. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to do part one of the message, and then the, the I'm calling them the rejoicing team. The rejoicing team is going to get up here and lead us this morning. Uh, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people and the joy that it is to come into the house of the Lord and make much of you and have our hearts changed and transformed to look more like your son. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, as I said, this morning we are diving into the advent of joy. And we'll get into here in a little bit, what does our culture say around joy? What what does the Bible have to say around joy? Um, but what I wanted to do to start out and prepare us to sing and lift our voices, kind of give you the definition that we're going to be working with today of what is biblical joy. Biblical joy is our ability to choose to have faith in Christ, that Jesus, the Son of God, will hear about his declaration and arrival in a little bit, but that Jesus, the Son of God, put on flesh, lived as a baby, grew into a man, lived a perfect life, died in our place for our sin, that the tomb is empty, and that he has gone to prepare a place for us, and that we anxiously await the second advent of joy when our King comes back to get us. We choose to believe in Him over our circumstances. We choose to believe in His work over our work, His abilities over our abilities. And so that's going to be our definition. And what I want us to briefly look at as we unpack this, and, and again, like if you're newer with us, our typical rhythm is we teach through books of the Bible. We go kind of line by line, verse by verse, um, <clears throat> and, and just walk through and try to like ring out the scripture. This morning is going to be more of a systematic approach, a high level overview. Um, and so if you guys, like if you grew up in Sunday school and VBS, you're familiar with Bible drills and you're really good at jumping from book to book, verse to verse, today is your day. You are, you are going to shine because we're going to be all over looking at what does God's word say about joy. But the first few things I want us to see is that joy, true joy, comes from the Father, Son, and Spirit. I feel like from Genesis 3 to today, one of the schemes of the enemy is to get us to believe that God is a cosmic killjoy, that he actually wants to withhold things from us. And that's just simply not true. When we look at Genesis 1, we're told that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That when God looks at his creation, after making the sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the animals, man, woman, everything, he looks and he goes, this is awesome. I did a good job, a very good job. And the psalmist, reflecting on God's work and God's creation, says, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his work, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. Our God is a God of rejoicing. Our, our God is a God of joy. And he looks at the work that he does and he celebrates that. And so this morning as we come into his presence, if you're going through a hard time, if life has been difficult, God is at work and rejoicing in he's not done with you. But it's not just the Father. This is also, we see, part of Jesus, the Son's story as well. In John 15, speaking to his disciples, Jesus tells them, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in me, in my love, abide in my love, remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love, remain in his love, and then verse 11 of John 15, he says, These things I've spoken to you so that, your jo that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. One of the reasons Jesus comes as the little baby that we're going to sing about and we're going to make much of this morning 
and lives the life we couldn't live and dies the death we should have died is to give us joy, to allow us to choose him and a relationship with God over our circumstances. He comes to give us full joy. And then in Galatians 5, if you've grown up in church or been around church for a little while, you're familiar with the fruit of the Spirit. That one of the byproducts of following Jesus is that the old you dies, the new you is alive in Christ, and what is produced is fruit. Where there used to be sin, where there used to be death, where there used to be chaos, fruit begins to grow. And look at one of the byproducts of following Jesus, one of the fruits that is produced from a healthy walk with Christ. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy right out of the gate. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We're told against these things there is no law. The Spirit indwells us to produce in us joy. It is an act of God to say, my circumstances are tough, but I'm going to choose Jesus over myself. I'm going to trust his work and that he's not done. And so joy is from God. And then we also are told in the Bible that joy is especially in the Old Testament, but it's just almost just as present in the New Testament, is really experienced in community. When we come together, something sacred happens as we get to join God in rejoicing. We get to experience joy in community. And so we're going to do that through singing songs. We're going to do that through a coffee break in a little bit and getting to know each other and mingle. And we're going to get to do that through communion and coming and, and being in community with the Spirit by, or with the Son by the Spirit. And in Zephaniah 3, I know all of you were in Zephaniah this week having dip, deep, rich, quiet times. Um, but in Zephaniah, the prophet of God, declares after a season of suffering, after God's people are going through hard things, he tells them, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. When we stand and we rejoice and we sing, we are experiencing the joy that the Lord came to give us and is manifested in the people of God, singing, exalting, rejoicing, and putting our hope in a future kingdom and in our confident king. And so I'm going to pray, <clears throat> and then we're going to stand, and we're going to rejoice we're going to celebrate the advent of joy we get this morning by coming together as God's people. And so, Father, I thank you for the advent of joy that we get to choose this morning to celebrate, to follow, to make much of you and the work that you are doing pray that we would sing aloud. I pray that we would rejoice, that we would exalt, that this would not just be an act of obedience, but it would be a joy-filled expression of the work that you're doing in us. And so, Father, would you be pleased? Would you be glorified? Would you be exalted? It's in your name we pray. Amen. I just want to take would a moment to, to say that we're going to go through our joy Advent calendar. Uh, calendar. Did it in first service, too. Advent candle today. And just how beautiful it is that we're following the Advent wreath because it looks backwards towards what God has done and through Christ's sacrifice. And it looks forward to our his future coming, his second coming, and our future in eternity with him and how, how those two things are acting at the same time. So Nate asked us to uh, read Luke 2, 8 through 20 from the message paraphrase. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. They had sat, set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly God's angels stood among them and God's glory blazed all around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A savior has just been born in David's town a savior who is Messiah and master. This is what you're to look for. 
a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's go over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child, and all who heard the shepherds were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. The shepherds returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they'd been told. So Nate asked us to share uh, something that we do in our home that exemplifies Jesus in this busy time. Um, and so as I thought about this, I realized that well, we have four kids, nine and under, and um, we've kind of been doing a tradition without even thinking about it, but when our oldest was young, we started laying underneath the Christmas tree and, you know, with our heads just looking up at the lights. And um, we also would usually sing Silent Night as we did it. Um, so I wrote down my reflection on this moment, and I'd like to read it. With a very loud and busy house, I'm always amazed how the lights on the tree create awe and silence. It's no good. <laughs> Each of us is taken back at the glow and beauty in that moment. We all know that our human nature is drawn to light. It's why we love cozy fires and driving around to see Christmas lights. Inside each of us is a desire to see and be close to light, which is why when we are honest with ourselves, our hearts long for Jesus, the powerful, loving, and freeing light. Much like the Advent candles, um, this is a moment that our family sets aside to be still, quiet, and remember that we are celebrating the light of the world. I almost feel like we could just like say amen, pray, and like be done, um, but but I got notes, so um, so we're gonna keep going. But that was awesome. Thank you, Stuart. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, this morning is a little bit different. We're taking a systematic approach to to looking at joy, and I love uh, I love the way the message put. Some of what we just looked at, I'm just going to pull a couple of things out here, and then, um, <clears throat> and then we're going to dive into looking at what is cultural joy versus biblical joy, and how can we leave here this morning with em empowered, really, to have biblical joy. Uh, but I loved this phrase, seeing was believing, that as the shepherds had their eyes opened to the joy and the announcement of the Lord, that they had to see for themselves. And as they saw the Christ, they were, they were swept up, caught up into belief. And then I really like how Eugene Peterson puts, the shepherds returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. That just there is something that happens in our soul when we experience the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And one of the schemes of the enemy, one of the ploys that has been around forever and isn't going anywhere, is that culture is going to constantly try to combat our joy and get us to try to find joy, try to find fulfillment in someone or something else. And so, again, we've already looked a little bit at our definition of biblical joy. It is choosing to have faith in Christ above your circumstances, above your abilities, to say, Jesus, I'm going to believe and trust in you and your work more than what's going on around me. 
That's going to be our working definition this morning. But I also think it's helpful for us to define, well, what what does culture say? What is our world outside of these walls? What are we bombarded with over and over again? And, and I did a lot of deep dive research on what does culture say about joy. And by that, I mean I Googled things for a little bit. I did not spend a ton of time on this. But here's, here's what we know. Here's what we see. Our culture, our world, uses joy and happiness synonymously. They treat them like, it's the, like we are inundated with joy is happiness and happiness is joy. It is the same thing, and biblically speaking, that's just simply not true. As followers of Christ, I want us to walk out this morning, if we know nothing else, that just because you're happy doesn't mean you're joyful, and you can have joy and not be happy. Those are not synonyms. And I went to a Times article uh, that I found online, and I would say Time Magazine, that's probably a pretty good uh, communicator of what does our culture think they are, not that they're right, but they have a massive influence. I saw some of you go, they're not good. I'm like, I agree. But they have a widespread influence into how we think as a people. And according to an article that was literally titled, How to Have More Joy, or something like that, these were some of the things that, that Time Magazine said, if you want more joy in your life, here's what you should do. First off, make happiness your goal. Ugh. Like, if your goal is happiness, all it takes is on the way home for those train tracks on the backside of our church right here, for those, those railroad uh, arm things to drop down, and you have to wait five extra minutes to get home and have lunch. For me to go a little bit long and take 10 extra minutes of your day for for a flat tire or like happiness fades so fast. And so if our goal is happiness, we're in a world of hurt. But according to our culture, one of the ways for us to increase joy is just, just make happiness your goal. So if it makes you happy, go for it. Seems like that'd be problematic. Second, think happy thoughts. Now, the Bible will tell us that we are to take thoughts captive, that we are to renew our mind around the hope and person of Jesus. That is right, good, and true. But if you go home this afternoon and your kids are screaming and crying and somebody's bleeding and something's on fire and your wife is angry and losing her mind, it is not time for you to go to your chair and embrace your inner Bob Marley and just don't worry, be happy. It's not just, oh, let me imagine myself on a beach with an umbrella drink when life is crumbling all around me. That's not going to bring us joy. To just think happy thoughts is fleeting, and it will fade so fast and probably get something thrown at you. Third, and man, if this is not a lie that we just all fall into, and and I'm looking like, who's the youngest one in the room? Sophia maybe doesn't know it yet, but she will soon. Buying happiness, come on, that does not work. Like, the best part of a new iPhone is just peeling the plastic off the iPhone and then it's like old, and you're like, ugh, that was, that was the best part. It's over now. It's like a used car. It's not any good anymore. Like, but, but according to culture, if we want joy, we can just buy it. Buy what makes me happy. Buy that new car. Buy that new phone. Buy that new house. Buy that new boat. If you buy the new boat, let me know. I'll come break it in with you when it's warm. Um, but happiness can be bought, and it's a lie. We all have closets and crawl spaces and basements full of stuff we thought would make us happy, and it simply hasn't worked. Yet culture continues to sell us this lie of, man, if you just get that new car, you'll be happy. And you will for a moment, and it will fade. And then the last one that I wanted to highlight before we return to what does the Bible have to say? And I love this phrase, actually. I like simple phrases. I like catchy, easy to remember. And so there's a part of this phrase that, like, really pulls at my heart. Think less me and more we. 
That's a good, that's a great phrase. I love that. We should think less about me and more about we. Here's the problem. If I embrace the first three, that fourth one is impossible. Because we, you, become either an object or an obstacle in my pursuit of happiness. And if you get in the way of me making happiness my goal, I can't think about you. I need to steamroll over you because happiness is my goal. Or I turn you into an object of my happiness. And I'm just going to use you and dehumanize you. You no longer are an image bearer of God. You exist to make me happy. That's not we. That's me. This is impossible. A great phrase. I love it. But it can't happen if this is how we pursue joy. And this is what the world around us is constantly feeding us. This is what your neighbor, your coworker, your friends, the people at your gym, this is what we're chasing after and bombarded with all the time. And so it's imperative if we're going to have an advent, an arrival of joy in our stories this season, that we not only see the lies, but we see truth. And so quickly, we are going to walk through what does the Bible have to say about joy? We started out already this this morning with seeing how the word shows us that our God is a joyful God. And Jesus came to give us his joy. And a fruit of the spirit is joy. And that joy is experienced in community. But we also see biblically that something culture just really can't get a handle on. That the Bible really frees us up in. Is that there is joy found in repentance. From Genesis 3, when our first parents messed up and they hid from God, we have all believed the lie that, man, if I'm fully known, if God sees me for who he, who I am, I'm in a world of hurt. And the reality of the gospel, the beauty of God's story, and how he has written this universe is that when we realize we don't have it all together and that we need a savior, God meets us right there. Every single time. Biblical joy finds, finds freedom and hope and peace in repentance. And so let's just look real quickly at a couple of verses. In Luke 15, I love, I love Luke 15. Jesus is telling a bunch of stories and, and highlighting for the disciples and those who are gathered and listening to him the joy that takes place in heaven when a sinner is saved when they repent and they realize, I don't have it all together and I need a rescuer. I need a savior. And he's using all of these everyday illustrations and examples to show that God, our God is a God of joy when we come to the end of ourselves and he can enter in and rescue us. And so Jesus says this, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who who need no repentance. There is joy in heaven when we realize, Jesus, we desperately need you. When we choose to trust Jesus over our abilities, the kingdom of heaven rejoices. When there is vertical repentance, when we spend time going, God, I don't have it all together. I don't have the answers. I am a mess. I am broken and I need you. Heaven rejoices. There is joy in you acknowledging I can't do it. Jesus knows you can't do it. That's why he came as a baby to live the life we couldn't live, to die the death we should have died. But it doesn't just stop vertically. It expands horizontally as well. In Acts chapter 15, as the church is blowing up and people are getting saved, the church is met with kind of this little bit of a controversy. As Jews are coming to faith in Christ, all of a sudden Gentiles, those outside of God's chosen people, are also trusting and repenting of their sin and putting their hope in Christ. And the church is met with this, this kind of conflict of, is this okay and as word begins to spread that Gentiles are repenting of their sin and trusting and choosing to follow Jesus, look at what happens. 
It says, being sent away by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles and the response of the church when people repent. Is, and it brought great joy to all brothers. There should be in community a celebration when people go, I need help. So if you go to small group this week or you're in a regroup and somebody or you're at lunch or coffee and somebody's like, I'm really struggling. I need the Lord to get rid of this in me. There's this part of my heart that I just hate that is there and it's a continual struggle and grind and battle. We should rejoice when we see somebody come out of the the king, the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of the beloved son. We should rejoice. We should be a people who celebrate confession and repentance. The lie the enemy wants us to believe is get it all together and then God will be pleased with you. God says, no, no, no. Come to the end of yourself and let me start working. There's joy and freedom in repentance. And maybe this week for you, maybe your biggest action step is to practice some confession and repentance, some freedom in repenting before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so I'm going to give you Psalm 51 as maybe homework. If you feel the spirit right now going, man, I don't, I don't acknowledge my sin. I just ask God for a bunch of stuff. And you feel like you don't have a whole lot of joy or happiness. Maybe an action step for you this week would be to practice the prayer of Psalm 51, where the psalmist says, create in me a clean heart, O God, that acknowledges He's got a dirty heart. The work needs to be done. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Maybe this week this needs to be your prayer. And watch as repentance leads to joy. You choosing to have faith in Jesus and his work over your circumstances and your ability. There is joy in repentance. There is also joy. Joy produces faithful work. Biblical joy is faithful, whereas happiness is fleeting. Again, if I go five minutes long, if you get a little hangry and the railroad tracks, a, a, a train goes by, your happiness is gone. And it could ruin easily the rest of your joy, but, or the rest of your day. But as we go through trials and tribulation, the joy of the Lord actually gets more solid and secure. As we recognize, God, in this hard thing, you're doing something. Let's look at Acts 5. The apostles have started sharing the gospel and making Jesus known, and they're creating a ruckus. I love that word. A ruckus. They get arrested, and they get told, you can't share Jesus with anybody anymore. And after being let go, here is their response to suffering for the sake of the gospel. They say, then they left the presence of the council who has just told them, hey, be quiet, stop making Jesus known, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they didn't cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. As they go through hard times, their joy is found in, I get to suffer like Jesus did? Man, I'm going to endure. I'm going to be faithful. I'm not giving up. This is worth it. Joy produces faithfulness or steadfastness as we see in the book of James. And if this is one of my favorite defenses for the deity of Christ, that Jesus is fully God. The author of this book is the half-brother of Jesus. And if anybody could disqualify you from being God, it would be your family. You'd be like, I'm perfect. And your brother would be like, no, you're not. Do you know what you did to me in middle school? But Jesus' brother was so convinced that he was the Son of God, that he was the Christ and the Messiah, that he is the personification of the advent of joy, that he wrote a book saying we should follow him. He's worth surrendering to and trusting in. 
And in the midst of this book, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The fruit of the Spirit, the advent of joy in our lives as we go through hard things becomes more secure, not less. That doesn't mean, please, like, like let's eye contact, look up at me for a second. This doesn't mean your life is easy. This doesn't mean it's not hard. What you're going through can be unbelievably painful. Joy can look like tears. Joy can look like heavy hearts and weary souls. But it's choosing to trust, Jesus, you're at work, and I'm not giving up. It gives us the ability to withstand or be steadfast, as James just told us. It doesn't make it easy. It makes it worth it. But in order for us to have a biblical joy that chooses Jesus, okay, we need to repent. Okay, we need to be faithful. But in a lot of ways, we have to be future-oriented. It can't be on today because today is so unstable. We have no idea what the rest of today is going to hold for us. And so for us to choose joy and choose Christ, we have to have a point fixed in the future that makes today worth it. Quick analogy that that maybe would hopefully help. This August, my wife and I will be married 20 years. I know, I don't look old enough to be married 20 years. None of you thought that. That's hurtful. Um, But... When we, were, when we were engaged and doing all of the wedding stuff, we got married pretty quick. We were only engaged four months. We were doing all of the wedding planning stuff. I can remember at several points going, can we just be done and go to the courthouse? Like, it's so much work to have a wedding and try on a suit and invite dudes I don't even know to be my groomsmen to try to keep up with the amount of uh, uh, whatever the ladies' version of that is called. Um, And it just was like, ugh. But what got me through was I'm going to have a wedding, and I'm going to get to be married. And that's going to be awesome. And so I kept my eye on the prize. It wasn't the grind of putting together CDs. That's how old we are. We had CDs of what we were going to play at our reception or picking out snacks and food or deciding what suit and colors and all the things. But it was, we're going to be married. And it's going to be awesome. I needed my eyes on a future date to make the day-to-day grind of creating a wedding worth it. And 20 years in, I'm like, the wedding was a thing. The marriage has been awesome. We need something as followers of Jesus to keep our eyes focused on. Luckily, we don't have to guess. The Lord in Revelation 19 gives us what we should keep our eyes on. In Revelation 19, John, the author of this book, gives us a picture for us to remain future-oriented in our joy. He says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true words of God. Look at that last part in verse 9. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. For you and I, for followers of Christ, we are invited to a a feast. This gives us a future orientation, something to be hopeful for, that even when life is impossible today, we can choose joy. We can trust Christ. Because this day is coming. 
it allows us to be steadfast in our joy. And lastly, and if we were to jump back, all that the culture tells us we're to do, buy happiness, think happiness, choose happiness, and just we, not me, that's all on me to hold together. I have to have the money in my bank account to be able to buy the happiness that the world tells me I deserve. I have to have the ability to slow down and think the thoughts that are supposed to make me happy when life is crumbling. That's all me focused and in my power. The Bible tells us that biblical joy, it can't, it not only can it not be focused on the here and now, it can't have me at the center. It needs Christ at the center. He comes to give us the fullness of his joy. In Luke 2, we heard it in the message, paraphrase, but the angel says to the shepherds, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy that's going to be for all the people. And then there's this declaration that, that uh, for unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is the declaration of joy. Jesus is the person of joy. Our focus, if we're to have joy, is we need to choose Christ, have our eyes fixed on Christ. And so this morning, what I want us to do is we kind of wrap up and begin to prepare our hearts for communion. I want us to focus on Jesus. And I know this time of year, it's easy to to like have our hearts drawn back to the manger, and that's beautiful, that's right, and that's good. But I actually want for us this morning to look at the next advent of joy, the next coming of Christ, and the picture of Jesus that we are going to see, that we get a glimpse of in Revelation 19. And this is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, and I love this picture because it's so different than the version of Jesus I grew up. I grew up with like hippie, bolder, Sunday felt bored Jesus who, you know, just truthfully wasn't kind of a guy worth following most of the time. This is the picture the Bible gives us of who we're to focus on in the person of Christ. John says, then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems or crowns. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. I think that's so awesome, that Jesus has like this super secret name that only he gets to know. That's how amazing this king is. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a man worth focusing on. This is a God. This is a king who will help us endure through whatever you're going through today. And when we choose him over our abilities and our circumstances, we find joy. This sounds like a very competent king, worthy of glorifying, worthy of praising, worthy of running towards. And again, please don't mishear me. We're not this huge mega church. Like I can look around this room. There's hard things happening in our stories. For some of you, joy today looks like weeping. Joy today looks like heavy hearts that are choosing to say, Jesus, I'm not giving up and you're teaching me something. And my hope is there's a marriage supper waiting for me and I'm going to keep following the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That doesn't make it easy, it makes it worth it. And so as we prepare our hearts for communion, as the rejoicing team comes back up, I'm going to try to change our culture. I'm going to start calling it that. This is what we've seen in God's word. And next to each kind of like little point, I have maybe an action step. That here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit in this moment. As you prepare your hearts for communion, 
if the Lord is stirring and tugging and prompting that, man, you need, you need to place your faith in Christ, that you came in here today and you are in the domain of darkness. You have not trusted in Christ as your Savior. I mean, let today be the joy of your salvation. Confess and repent. Believe in him. Maybe you need to spend a few moments just confessing and repenting. You need to run towards him. You need to have your heart oriented around the future hope and the person of Christ. I'm just going to ask that it would be still for a moment. That you would allow the spirit to show you where you need an advent of joy. The arrival of joy where you need to choose Jesus over what you're facing right now. And then I'm going to pray, and when, we're re- when you're ready, you can make your way to the table remembering his broken body, his shed blood. The King of kings and Lord of lords suffered and sacrificed himself to bring you full joy in a relationship with him. Let's take a moment and be still before the Lord before I pray. Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. I thank you that you have given us your spirit, that you produce joy in our lives as we follow you together. So, Lord, I pray that your spirit would continue to work in this room, continue to show us where we need to reject the lies of the world, reject the lies of the enemy that has have us chasing happiness all over the place and living frustrated lives. And instead, this morning, would we leave here choosing joy in following you? God, would we invite others into our stories? Would we invite others into the hardships and the things that we're facing so that we can experience the joy of being known, the joy of being in community, and the beauty of your bride that is ever moving closer to that marriage supper with you, King Jesus. And so I pray that as we come to the table and remember your broken body, your shed blood, would it be in anticipation of that day with our hearts fully focused on you. We love you, we praise you, we rejoice in the work that you're doing in us and through us. It is in your majestic name we pray. Amen. When you're ready, you can make your way to the table.